Jesus, take the wheel. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I can't sing, obviously. <laughs> Who's it, Carrie Underwood? <laughs> I have no idea. Je just pray, Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> Welcome back to The Abundant Life. I'm Angela Todd. This is my fully anointed husband, Charles. And look out because we don't know if in this episode the Holy Spirit will just overtake us and we will lay prostrate and just pray for you. Amen. But you're going to want to stick around and stay tuned because you don't know what God's going to do. So moving on to number 13 on the ways that God can supernaturally get provision for you is creation, recreation, and restoration. So the first one is is creating something from faith. Ooh. So it's like, you know, it's you're, you're creating. Right. You know, you're creating something, so it's a supernatural way that you're getting it. So go ahead and read the first scripture there out of Hebrew. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3, New King James Version. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So what I really like about this is that faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith, your faith. So a lot of times I think when you hear the word hope, like in the world, it's like, I hope I get this, or I hope I get healed, or I hope this happens for me. It's like, it's like a 50-50 chance of something happening. I'm just hoping for it. But no, biblical hope is that that's the substance. You know, that's the, that's your where your faith comes from, is from that hope. And when you think about this, when I was meditating on this, like when you have a substance of something, say you're going to bake a cake, you need the substance. You need the flour, you need the mix, you need the egg, the water, whatever it is, you have those substance. And then you mix that up and you bake it and then that becomes that cake. So the substance is what makes that. And this is what this is saying is that your faith, the hope and the faith is your substance to make it create. You don't need natural things to make something come to life. It's just that faith. Right. It's that hope right. that it will come. And how did, what did God do? He used that by speaking. He spoke, in, he spoke every single thing in Genesis. He spoke it into creation. He spoke it. He didn't say, well, let me make man, let me get some... You know, some organs over here, and let me get some, uh, you know, hair and some skin. Let me put the substance together. No, he spoke it into existence. Right. He spoke, you know, the our entire earth, all the water, everything. He spoke it into existence because he spoke by faith. That's so powerful. Again, we have that teaching on your words and taking you to a destination. And we talked about 30, 60, and 100 fold and speaking that, using that as the water over your seed to allow for the harvest to come. The other thing that it says right there at the end of it, we're not made of the things that were visible. Meaning like, you know, you're gonna build a house. It's like, you need all the lumber, you need all the building materials. Those are visible things to build that structure. And faith will build those things out of things that are not visible. So when you put your faith at work, then it can go out into the spiritual realm. It doesn't have to be limited to what can happen right here in this earth realm. Your faith goes to work in the spirit realm. And once it gets out in the spirit realm, then the things will start happening in the spirit realm to then manifest this thing onto the earth. That and that, that's so how, good. that's how you're, you know, your giving is, that's how your giving works. It's like you give it and then you don't know what happens with there. But let me tell you what, as soon as you give, man, angels are going to work. God's going to work. There's all this stuff going on to make that manifestation, that multiplication happen up there so that it's delivered onto this earth. That's and so your good. faith can supernaturally bring you provision in whatever it is that you want. And if you don't have any faith, you can use the faith of the Lord because there's scripture that says the Lord's faith. Having so, the God kind of faith. Having the God kind of faith. So if you don't have any faith, you can say, God, your faith. Amen. And allow him and focus your efforts on his faith and then watch what he'll do. And you know, that's a really good point. It brings up something. Um, you know, we had that teaching, we talked about that faith works by love mm -hmm. and how we taught that was that it's not about you having great love in other people or you having great love in the Lord. It's about you understanding that God loves you. And when you know that how much he loves you, that's when your faith will connect to the things of the kingdom of God. And it's the same thing here. It's not about, do I have enough faith to get healed or do I have enough? Because I used to do this when I would like be believing for something and it wasn't happening. I was like, 
is my faith not big enough? Am I, what am I not doing right? I'm not, you start questioning yourself. And you what do, are you, what are you doing? You're it's getting natural. into self-righteousness because you're putting your faith in your own faith. Mm-hmm. And what, like what you were saying, it's like, you got to put your faith in his faithfulness. <clears throat> That's good. You got to be like, God, you're so faithful that I know your word's going to come to pass in my life. And you're going to believe in him. And you're believing in his faith and not in your faith. And that's true humility. It's getting the attention off yourself and putting your attention onto Jesus and the finished work of the cross. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> it's always the manifestation of God's presence. And it's the presence is thick right now. When we start talking about him and his faith and his faithfulness and his love. Lord, we just thank you. Whoever is watching this right now and whoever is um, you, self-condemning themselves because things haven't happened in their life. I pray, Lord, that your fresh faith of who you are and your love would just overtake them in a profound way. Lord, I ask that signs, miracles, and wonders would fall upon them right now and in their household, over their health, over their children, over their finances, over their relationships. Thank you, Lord. Lord, that they hear from you. Thank you, Lord, you open the eyes of their understanding that you pour out a blessing so big they not have enough room to contain it. Thank you, Father. He might be going, what just happened? (laughs) And, you know, it's like Angela saying, like when the presence of God comes and fills like your heart and fills a room or fills a church or fills, fills whatever it is, it's like you cannot deny that presence. And it's just like, it can be overwhelming. That's why we start crying like that. The other thing too is that, you know, we have an agenda here. We have a teaching. We're following this. We're following the scriptures. You know, your life is the same way. You may have a business plan. You may have like your task written out for the day or whatever. And you may have a presentation you have to make. Whatever it may be, there may be a plan and you should make a plan. I mean, the Bible talks about, you know, write it down. Yeah. You know, write those things down. It's important to do that. But what you have to do, my point that I want to make is that when you're going through that, you got to be willing to stop and yield to the Holy Spirit. And the right. way I like to always describe that is like when you're driving and you come up to a yield sign, you slow down, you wait and you look, and then you let those other cars that you're supposed to be yielding to get in front of you. Right. You don't stop. The, the sign doesn't say stop. It ain't a stop sign. It's a yield sign. It's the same way with this. It's like when you're moving throughout your task, moving throughout your day-to-day office, whatever it is, you got to be willing to like yield, let the Holy Spirit take that front, and then get behind Him and let Him lead because He's always going to take you to a much better place than where you're going. He's going to give you the right words. He's going to put you at the right place at the right time. He's going to open doors that no man can open. But you have to be willing to say, I'm going to put my agenda aside right now. You know, I'm going to do put what I got on hold because I'm going to get behind that spirit. That's what you just did is that you yield to the Holy Spirit and then pray for people because who knows what happened. I guarantee you there's somebody who was out there was healed through those words. Somebody was delivered through those words. So, but you've got to be able to just yield. Right. It's so good. And he says that he will direct you. He will be that voice that directs you. You just allow him to lead. What's that song? Jesus, take the wheel. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I can't sing, obviously. <laughs> Who's it, Carrie Underwood? <laughs> I have no idea. Je- just pray, Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> just take it. <laughs> All right, so we talked about creating something from faith. Now let's talk about creating something from very little. Ooh, okay. Go ahead and read John 6.11 for us there, please. John 6.11. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. So talking about creating something out of little. So there was little. The the boy's lunch, he had a couple fish and some it says loaves, but it probably was like small stuff. It's probably like little rolls instead of loaves, you know, because this is a kid's lunch, you know. But they took, it was taken by the Lord and multiplied. And we talked a little bit about this, I think, in one of the previous episodes about, you know, how the, the, the disciples said, what is this among so many? That, what is this so little among so many? It's like they were looking at the need. They are looking at the need of what, they, what was in front of them and what they had to fulfill that need. And they're like, it ain't going to work. Right. And what did Jesus do? took it and he said, Father, I thank you. <laughs> he thanked you and then it was multiplied. So it's right. taking that little and giving thanks. And we talked about this, I think, in Titan. It's like, sometimes we look at what's in our bank account. It's like, how is this so little among so much of these bills? <laughs> you know, and that's a great time right there to say, Father, I thank you thank for what you. I got in my account right now. Lord, I thank you for what I got in my hand right now. You get into that place of thanksgiving. The whole point here is that 
taking that little and being able to have it supernaturally multiply. Multiplied. It goes yeah. back to the multiplication. Read the next one to us for because another one goes along with this, 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17, 13 through 14. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as you have said. But make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it to me, and after, for thee and for thy son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord send rain upon the earth. The audacity of this guy. This guy, huh? Going in there. By the way, I know you're going to die, but make me some cake first. Well, and that's the whole point of this, is that... The Lord had already instructed Elijah said, he said, go to this town and this widow is going to take care of you because it was a time of drought and famine. Right. And this lady, the only thing she had, talk about a little, because when you go and you read the whole context of this, it says that she was gathering up sticks. She told Elijah, I'm gathering up the sticks and I'm going to bake this for me and my son. We're going to die. We're going to die. We're done. That's it. And once he say, yeah, bring me some water, bring me that cake and bring it to me. Go ahead, make it for me. Just go ahead. So what does she do? She does what Second Chronicles 20, 20 says. She listened to the prophet and she prospered. Mm -hmm. And when you look at some of this commentaries, it will say that the, the barrel of oil and the meal didn't fail. It was three year period. So the next three years they ate off of this and now, until they came out of the time of famine, until they came out of the time of drought. Was that a thousand times more, a million times more? Say one that would be a lot. If you had if you had one cake and that cake fed you for three years, you got some good multiplier out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the whole point. Right. It's even out of the little. Look what he did out of the little. Fed him for three years. Wow. You know, took care of him for the three years. Kept him from death. That little saved him from death. <laughs> Can you imagine the persecution her family would have gotten if he, when he asked her that, and she was making it, all of her other family members? Can you even imagine? What? You're going to give that to the preacher? What? You're giving that to the prophet? I mean, come on, right? Well, I think, you know, another point with this is that, you know, a lot of times when we see somebody in a desperate need like this, let's just say somebody came to the church or somebody came to our ministry and they're in a great need. Hey, I've only got one meal left in my refrigerator and I'm afraid my son's going to die tonight after we have this last meal. What would you be like? Like, Oh my gosh, you know, can we get you something? What, what can we do? Can you, we'll take you to this food bank. You start thinking about what you can do for them. But how many times we say, how much do you got in that refrigerator? One meal? All right, how about taking that one meal and sewing that meal? I mean, like our minds really don't go there. And I'm not saying that's... that, I'm not saying that's what you do in every circumstance like that. You say, okay, well, every time poor comes, you need to tell them to give everything they got. It has to be directed by the Lord. Right. But my point that I'm trying to make is our natural minds, that's where they want to go. Right. They want to step in and fill that place of what God's trying to do in their life. But that might not be what's, what needs to be done to change this person's life. So the next one is recreation of a substance. Ooh, that's interesting. Go ahead and read from John. Two there for us. John 2, 7 through 10, NIV. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. So, I mean, this is a pretty familiar part of scripture where people, oh, Jesus turned the water into wine. It's kind of, well, okay, great. And it was his first miracle. You know, there's something in the Bible called the law of first mention. When something first happens, it's got to have great significance in it. So the first miracle of Jesus, he turned water into wine. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, we think, shouldn't he heal somebody? Shouldn't he, like delivered demons out of somebody. <laughs> he made wine. <laughs> you know? He made a party. <laughs> you know, because last longer, he made the party last longer. Well, because wine represents celebration and joy in the Bible. But the point that I want to get from this is that what was the substance he started with? Water. Water. Okay. And so, and what did he turn it into? Wine. Not the best wine. The best wine. So let's say we have a bottle of water here. And then we have, what's the best wine you could get in the world? How much would that best bottle of wine cost? Hundreds of thousands Thousand, of dollars? Yeah. I mean, so you're talking about, you could have a bottle of water for 99 cents and it could be turned into hundreds of thousands of dollars. Or 
free, right, from the hose. They can have yeah. filled pictures with the hose, right? It's the point they wanted to make here is that the substance doesn't necessarily have to be relevant to what the multiplication of the blessing can be. Water turned into the best wine. It doesn't have to be like, well, I'll take this big offering and turn it into a really big offering. <laughs> you know, or I'll give this great thing, this great painting or whatever this thing. So, you know, I can bless this person and receive this. It, it can be insignificant. And when I was thinking about this this morning, it made me think of a testimony that Jesse DePlantis I heard him give one time. And it was basically, I'll just summarize it. Him and two of his friends go to a coffee shop and they're having coffee. One of his friends says, hey, you know that one piece of property over here? He goes, it's for sale. It's for sale for $30,000. And he goes, do you guys want to go in with me on it? He goes, $10,000 a piece, we can go in on it. And Jesse's like, that old swamp land, that old junky land over there? He's like, are you kidding me? He's like, no, I ain't putting $10,000 into that. Are you crazy? Yeah. And he had ten grand in his pocket. <laughs> That's right, he did. Wadded up with rubber bands. <laughs> he had it <laughs> the on him. Days. It was well, pocket. He still do it. No, that wasn't heathen. It, it was pocket change for him. It was pocket change for him. So, long story short, I think it was the state of Louisiana came along and they offered this guy three million dollars for that property. This was a short period of time. It was just months. Okay. It wasn't like it was years. So he sold it, and he made the profit on that, but what is 30,000 to a million? What's the multiplier to get to that? It's a hundred times. A hundred fold. Right. The guy got a hundred fold return on his vessel. Here's the thing. They all looked at as not the one guy, but the other two guys, that just old swamp land. What is that land? That land ain't no good. There's just some water out there. It ain't got no like nice mountains or, you know, there's just, what is that? What in, is that? In, in case you're wondering, that's Louisiana. <laughs> was I getting Accent. a twang on it? I'll, <laughs> yeah. I was trying to be like Jesse. <laughs> nobody could be like from, Jesse. Yeah, nobody could be like Jesse. He's awesome. Go to our mentor resources and listen to his stories. He'll make you laugh and cry all at the same time. Amen. So the point once again is that what man saw as insufficient, what he thought, what, what could be done with that land? Right. God took and multiplied it a hundred times more right. and got a return for that guy because he listened, right. because he listened. So don't look at whatever it is that you might be being led to give or might, what you might be willing to do or being told to do. Don't look at it as insufficient. Or insignificant. If it's That's good, yeah. insignificant, don't judge it. We all want to go there. We all want to judge it for what it is. All right, moving on to the last one here. Supernatural restoration. Joel 2.25, New King James Version. So I will restore you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. Okay, first of all, we have swarming, crawling, consuming, and chewing. What? <laughs> I didn't know there were so many different kinds. <laughs> well, I think That's the point is like, sound very good. it's just not what you think it just, well, locust can just come flying. It's like, so... All these things can come and take away from you in this one form. You say, well, what about the ones that swim? What about the ones that crawl? What about, the point is, it doesn't matter how whatever the enemy comes to take away from you. It's like, God's got it. God's, God's got that. So read the next one, Psalm 69 for us. Psalm 69 for King James Version. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. So what the Lord is saying here is that he didn't take it away. He did not take it away, but even though he didn't take it away, that he's gonna restore it. I mean, that's God's heart for you, even though he's not the one that comes to steal, kill, and destroy, as it says in John 10, 10. He says, no, I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So anytime that something's being stealing, killing, destroying, that's not God. Right. That is not God. That is the enemy. It's very clearly written in there. So, you know, what's going on here is that, you know, with Job is it wasn't God that took this stuff away. Right. Even though Job's, Job said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. That wasn't correct. It was inaccurate what he said. Was it the word of God and God? Yes, it was. But if you fast forward to chapter 42, then what Job is saying is he's saying, Lord, I, you know, I didn't know. He's repenting. He's like, I didn't know. I didn't hear. I didn't see. I didn't know all this stuff. And he repents of that. Right. 
of, of saying that, of, of what everything that was said bad about him, the Job repents from that. Right. And then what happens after he repents? Everything's restored. And you have to realize too that right during that same time that Eliphaz, is that how you say his name? Eliphaz. <laughs> Eliphaz. The Lord tells him, he said, hey, you and your two dudes, he's like, you bring an offering to me. He's like, bring the offering. And then I'm going to have, you're going to prepare and give the offering to me. And then I'm going to have Job pray for you. Because what were those dudes doing all throughout from that chapter two, all the way to chapter 42, or whatever? They're talking smack about God. They were they're they're doubt, trying unbelief. They're trying to get into his it. Motives, right? Yeah, he's saying all this bad stuff. Oh, you're gonna, you know, continue to serve God and you know all this type of stuff. They ain't talking smack. But they were good, honest Christians in the church, probably, knew, grew up with Job, probably, saw how he operated. What it all kind of boils down to is a spirit of self-righteousness. And also the fear of giving offerings for his children, like maybe his children had sinned, which put him in that deranged state where he's saying, the Lord give and the Lord take away. Well, and that's a really good point because Job said that. Right. He said, the thing I fear the most has come upon me. What was he afraid of? His kids sinning and then something happened to them. Right. So that, that fear created that, attaching to that, which then allowed Satan to come in and destroy all that. Mm -hmm. The whole point that I want to make about this is that God didn't take away his kids. He didn't take away his land. He didn't take away any of that stuff. And then when Job finally realizes how good God is, when he repents in his mind, and he says, I didn't know, I didn't see, I, you know, I, I didn't know what was going on. I, now I know your goodness. Now I know your goodness. And what does the Lord do? He restores everything. And how much did he restore it to? Double. Right. He restored double. Yeah. So the whole point about this, trying to make with this, is that God restored supernaturally Ooh. for him. Yeah. And even in his old age, he was able to have all these kids that I think that his daughter were the fairest, the prettiest in the land. Right. So God will always restore to you either better in quantity or in quality or in a combination of it. That's supernatural multiplication. That's supernatural provision coming through restoration from the one who didn't take it away, but the one who loves you. That's so good. And there's also the, one of the, I think it's the trespass offering where Jesus says that I will restore that which I did not take away and add one fifth to it. Amen. So if you have yeah. lost something, just know how good God is and believe him to not only restore that which he did not take away, but add one fifth to it. So that's 120%. So if you have lost something, yep. especially during this time and this season in 2020, during a time of famine, meditate on the promises of the Lord restoring that which he did not take away and adding one fifth to it. That's 120%. Amen. Amen. That is a good word for right now. People who have lost jobs, people who have lost businesses, um, lost loved ones even during yeah. this time. And you know, this isn't just a word for today that the anointing on this word can carry into the future no matter when this is listened to. It doesn't have to be just about 2020, it can be 2021, it can be 2030s, wherever it may wherever be. The word, the word of God still continues to hold that ability to deliver you, to be able to set you free, to be able to change things, rearrange things, and restore things in your life. That's the beauty of the Word of God. See, we expire, but the Word of God doesn't. <laughs> it's so powerful. Amen. Amen. So there you go. We had memorial giving, the law of multiplication, and by creation, recreation, and restoration. Amen. Some good stuff. So remember, continue to listen to the Word because faith comes by hearing. Continue to you know, get in your Bible every day, read, listen to anointed messages. Keep immersing yourself in the word because that's how this will come alive in your life. Amen. We are in agreement with your restoration, your recreation, your healing, your Amen. increase, your Hallelujah. two mites. Don't despise the two mites. Yep. Give God thanks. Give him Thank glory you, for what you do have. Yep. Be led by the spirit to so just again, yield to the spirit and be led in those things because it will only produce increase in your life. Amen. See your sowing and your giving as multiplying. You yep. are not going to be depleted when it leaves you. It's actually yep. going to be multiplied back Amen. into you. And we just declare that over your household 
and let the Lord just pour out a blessing so big you don't have enough room to contain it in your life. Satan, take your hands off their money. Angels, go now. Cause the money to come. Amen. Restoration to come. The health and the healing and all that your heart desires in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember that Jesus came so that you'll have life and have it more abundantly. Remember, we're praying for you. We love you. And come back and see us next time. Until then, Enjoy peace. the abundant life. Amen.